It was Carl Jung who said, until we take that which is unconscious and make it conscious, we'll continue to get it reflected back in our life and we'll call it fate. So that's the concept of projection. So we all have our stuff, our emotional baggage that we bring to the table. You'll hear in wealth creation courses, they say it's 70% mindset and 30% strategy. The mindset is so important in terms of everything that we create. Get ready to expand your thinking around what's financially possible and achieve personal freedom with Christopher Howard, a global phenomenon in the personal development industry who's helped millions transform their lives through his seminars, books, and coaching. With 25 plus years of success, black belts in martial arts, NLP, and experience working with politicians, celebrities, and Fortune 500 companies, Christopher provides transformative wisdom on unlocking human potential as he shares the principles that enabled him to overcome early financial struggles and build an eight-figure coaching business. I'm Bob Wheeler, and this is Money You Should Ask. This podcast, along with my books, workshops, and online courses, are designed to support you in getting to the heart of your financial struggles so you can break through inner money blocks and create the financial freedom you desire. Ensure you never miss an episode. Click that follow button on your favorite podcast platform. Okay. Let's expand our thinking around financial possibilities with personal development coach, Christopher Howard. Christopher, thanks for joining us on today's episode. My pleasure. Really thrilled to be here. What I'm really thrilled about is I saw you take your glasses. <laughs> I had no idea that they did that. That's <laughs> yeah, they have a magnet and they're pretty awesome. And yeah, it freaks people out all the time. They think I'm ripping my glasses apart like I'm Superman, but <laughs> just <laughs> really handy. <laughs> well, when you get your money issues handled, you become very strong. So... <laughs> That's right. My money muscles are being flexed. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So talking about money muscles, Christopher, on your site, you talk about going from broke to becoming a millionaire. Yeah. And I'm wondering what core mindset shifts did you have to make that enabled you to have your financial transformation? For me, I mean, life, it's kind of like it was a Frank Sinatra that said, you know, I've been a pirate, a poet, a pauper, a poet, you know, all those. uh, Right, right. So I've been through every kind of experience of life. But what shifted for me in terms of being able to attract a million dollars or at one point we were doing million dollar days over and over and over and over again. But what shifted for me was a couple of things. The idea of modeling, reverse engineering success, looking at what's the result that somebody produced and then breaking that down into manageable chunk sizes so we can make it transferable to ourselves, like the recipe, learning the recipe for that kind of success. So that 1000% made a difference in terms of my mindset. And it was really a combination of that modeling people within my field, modeling people outside of my field. So I went and I was modeling the billionaire mindset. And then I also found a mentor who had previously built a $60 million clothing business and having him, he got his MBA from Harvard when I was four years old. So his mentoring helped me to kind of close the gap on the shorter distance type things. Modeling is to become Richard Branson overnight. It's pretty big leap, but He was able to mentor and guide me along the shorter distance thing. So there's a number of things that changed the mindset, though, for sure. Now, that's awesome. And I'm curious because mentors are so important. And how do we know when we found the right mentor? Because there is a lot of life coaching out there. There's a lot of great people. There's a right fit and sometimes not a right fit. If I'm going to spend all this money and go for that, how do I know I'm getting the right mentor? Do they just drop into my lap? I love what Warren Buffett said when he says, tell me who your heroes are and I'll tell you what your life will become. And I think that the types of people that we look up to, if we're looking to reverse engineer success, one of the first things we say from a modeling perspective is you want to find a true role model of excellence. So if you model mediocrity, you'll get mediocrity. So being able to identify that true role model of excellence, why are you picking that person to look up to? And there's a difference between a hero and a mentor, but I would go to heroes first and say, why are you picking that person or that company that you might be looking at that you're looking to reverse engineer or something to get a template that you can follow and replicate a result? So I think being able to quantify what they're doing, to be able to look at, are they somebody that walks their talk and that sort of thing? And then to break it down from there is probably the first go to, I would say. Let me ask you this for yourself. Did you already have a mindset like when you were seven, eight, nine, 10? 15 of saying, I want success. I want abundance. I want to contribute to the world in some way. Or was it like, I just want to be a fireman. And did the tools 
help you get there or did the tools then help you decide that's where you wanted to go? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's super interesting. I think that from an archetypal perspective that it's been kind of a similar journey. Like when I was a kid, there's a sociologist, Dr. Morris Massey says who we are today is based to a large extent on who we chose to model when we were 10 years old. And you look at who your heroes were. For me, it was Luke Skywalker and (laughs) Spider-Man. And so there was like those types of heroes. But then for me also, things kind of evolved over time. And it wasn't until I realized as an adult that I could model again. I could go back to that time when I was 10 and I could look and kind of redirect and rechange the trajectory a bit. And that's when I started to do the modeling projects on the billionaire mindset so that I could rechannel the same energy. It's the same archetypal energy of, I look at what I do today, traveling around the world, helping people transform their lives. There's very much a kind of the superhero archetypal energy within that. But as an adult, I've learned why you can go out and you can learn the business acumen and the strategies and the financial vocabulary and all the stuff that helps you to upgrade or up-level your game. You can learn that and put who you can become or who I can become is far beyond what we would have even dreamt of when we were a kid, just because we were a bit naive. So it's like, oh, well, we can express it in all these even more powerful ways, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm curious, you work with a lot of people. I see this sometimes, I imagine you see this sometimes, where somebody like, I want the success, I've got the skills, and I've got the determination, but... I'm not quite the person that everybody else is, so I'm not going to quite get there. I might get there 70%. I can't fully be there because I'm the exception to the rule. Right. I guess as I was hearing that from you, I had two paths that I could go in my thinking. One was this person, do they just have a lot of limiting beliefs? Or did they not believe in themselves? Is their self-esteem not in jail? All that sort of thing. And then you've got the other side. Is the person just making excuses because they really don't, intend to step up, nor would they ever really want to step up. Yeah. In terms of taking charge of our destiny, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, like the only way that we're going to do that is to take responsibility is to step up in that realm. And there are some people that just don't want to take that level of personal responsibility for anything, let alone their financial success. But if it truly is, I want it, I want it badly. I just don't believe that I can have it. I don't believe that at least you've got the inherent motivation there working with the person they want it. So now we just got to help them get rid of those things that would prevent them from doing what they really want to do. The other person were like trying to push the mule up the hill. So one of the things that I'm sure you're familiar with is the idea of cause and effect. And if we put ourselves at cause for the results that we're producing financially in our life, then we're responsible. We're the beginning, we're the end, we're the alpha, the omega. We're like, we're everything. We're like, it all lies on us in terms of whether or not we produce that result. If somebody is justifying why they are where they should be or blaming others or shaming others for making it work for them in their lives, then that person is just making reasons and excuses that ultimately will keep them trapped at the effect of life. So for me, it's like, how do we get rid of people's reasons and excuses and move them over to the other side? And There is a difference between the two types of people, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think as you're saying that and you're pushing the mule up the hill, (laughs) there's this piece that I think sometimes, and maybe I won't say anybody else thought this. I think I thought this. I just wanted it all come really easily. Right. (laughs) I didn't want to have to look at myself. I didn't want to have to do a self-evaluation. I didn't want it to be difficult. I didn't want to see the blind spots in myself. It's uncomfortable. And I wished somebody had said to me, hey, Bob, it's not going to be a fun journey, but it's going to be an amazing journey. And so I held back on certain things because people might not like me. People might sabotage my work. There's all these things that I had going on and limiting beliefs. So I chose to, well, I'm just going to sit back a little bit because it seems uncomfortable if I move forward. Can you talk to that? Yeah, no, I get that. So it's kind of a combination. It's the limitation of those limiting beliefs are preventing you from tapping into the motivation that would help you to move. I heard somebody say at one point that it's not so much motivation that we need, it's momentum that we need more than anything. Because if you start to take your body there, telephone sales, they say smile and dial because it's going to carry a certain energy. It's going to take your body to where you want to go energetically in that case, and the energy that you want to elicit in that other person. But I think it's the same thing here where it's like, 
if we know that we want to transform our lives financially or otherwise, and how do we know? It, well, it's been said that in life, we pay attention or we pay with pain. And if we fail to pay attention to our relationships, we'll pay with pain. To, if we fail to pay attention to our health, we'll pay with pain. If we fail to pay attention to our finances, we'll pay with pain. And so if we're paying with some pain and we go, boy, I want to pay attention in a different way. And we know that we want it, but we're afraid and we're sitting in that place where we just don't believe it yet. Well, sometimes it's just taking our body, going through the actions. It's like breaking through the initial inertia when you go to the gym, where you're afraid it's not going to feel good, it's going to hurt. But if you just start going, you hit that point where the motivation can kick in. And the more you do it, the more you like it, the more you like it, the more you want to do it, you fall in love with it. And eventually things can change. I think there's faster ways to do it too. We can use tools such as neurolinguistics to change what we call those submodality distinctions. It's our salivary response. So we could actually change the way we feel about it and dive in. I think in most cases, if people take their body first, there could be a good starting point. Absolutely. And you bring up NLP, and I'm wondering for those folks out there that haven't done it, neurolinguistic programming, it's an amazing remapping. Can I just do this once? Can I do a little NLP? Can I do a little neurohypnotic transformation? One and done. Yeah. I don't now I don't have, I fixed myself. I adjusted the dial. I'm good, right? For the rest of my life. <laughs> it depends, right? <laughs> no, no, that totally depends. I, like, I'm not one that says that, would ever say that. No, the idea is, like, I'm not even talking about here's how you make change and change your life permanently. What I would say is here's how you open your mind to new neurological choices where you might have been previously stuck. So let's take a look at that. So the person that avoids, let's say, managing money, and they avoid managing their money because the certain associations that they have with that, well, that same person is going to have something that they dive into with utter abandon, like they don't even hesitate on. And so the way that they think about, like for me, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I love jiu-jitsu. I dive right in. I train sometimes three times a day. And there's a way that I think and feel about jiu-jitsu. Well, if we map across, as you indicated, the distinctions, the way that we code and store, in this case, jiu-jitsu in, in my mind and body, it actually goes the other way where you take the financial management, you put it into the submodality distinctions of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, then it's like you can choose to feel a new way about it. And they say that successful people are the people that get themselves to do the things that unsuccessful people are unwilling to do. But I take it one step further. Successful people are the people that get themselves to love to do the things that unsuccessful people are unwilling to do. Because if we can change that, then we can dive in and we don't have to go through that initial inertia and I've used those types of techniques successfully in many cases in my own life. I went from making 10 cold calls a day to 100 a day and loving the process because I changed my experience. So when we can take charge of our experience of life, we become infinitely more powerful as well. Yeah, that totally makes sense. If I'm going to enjoy it or I've found the pleasure in it, well, who doesn't like pleasure? I mean, I'm right. sure there are people out there that don't, but <laughs> they like the pain. Right, right. <laughs> For me, though, yes, if I can find a way to say, oh, even though it maybe isn't always 100% joyously fun in the moments, but I know the process and where it's going to lead me is going to be pleasurable. Absolutely. But you can also learn there's ways to map it across where literally we fall in love with the process. So like I remember my buddy Jim Gillespie was helping me with that. I'll map it across the money instead. So I'll change my story just a little bit so it matches what we're talking about here. But let's say that somebody was hesitating on learning about let's call it financial management, and they were hesitating on that, let's say that they love dancing. And you say, okay, well, how is financial management just like dancing? Well, your partner in this dance is your money. You need to lead. You can't just expect your partner to follow if you're not leading. And you can map it across. So you just take the analogy and you can map across the lexicon, the language of it, the key words that really jump out there so that you start to understand it in a new way that's more approachable for you. We say that the power of analogy is it takes us from the known to the unknown, where financial management's unknown for somebody, but dancing really resonates with them or sailing for that matter. It's about how you trim the sails and pull it in to catch the wind. It's not, are you an excellent sailor that's really honed your craft in a way that you can get from where you are to where you want to go? And you hear the metaphor in that that could be a very brilliant way for helping people to map across an affinity with something to something that they don't have the natural affinity with, but causes them to become extremely wealthy as a result of that. That's pretty cool change. Yeah, no, I love that because we can all find something. I love to dance or 
I'm thinking I'm big Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And so Return of the King and being able to see that model of, wow, okay, he's not always winning, but he's always showing up. Yeah, the life's an adventure. You're on this adventure, on this quest to find the treasure and slay the dragons. Like we can use so many metaphors like that. Like for Warren Buffett, for example, once again, his business is artistry. He sees it as creating his mosaic and bringing in all these different investments under his banner of Berkshire Hathaway. He sees that as creating the mosaic of the tapestry of his magic that he creates from an investment perspective. And anyone can understand falling in love with artistry. Right. It's easy to understand, but not many people fall in love with the finances in a way that set themselves free. Yeah, I love that. And I don't know if it's anchoring or attaching or whatever, but being able to see a similarity so that I can hold on to as a guideline or as a guardrail that, oh yeah, I don't know this, but I know that. Right. And if I can bring this over here, this can be a little bit smoother sailing. Yeah, so to speak, right? right. <laughs> exactly. There's a couple of thoughts that I have about it too, is that when we sort by differences, it makes it sometimes more difficult to take on a new task. So like I remember when I was learning to do public speaking, I had done a lot of stage work before that. I worked, I did a lot of microphone stuff, but I thought it was so different from what I wanted to do, which was to speak on and teach. It seems so different what I did before, but it wasn't until I said, well, how is this exactly like I, what I did before? The entertaining of people. And then when I brought that in, it came alive. And I think it's the same thing when we stop sorting by difference and say, how is finance so different from everything I've done? We go, no, how is it exactly the same as the things that I've done? And then we can infuse even more of our uniqueness into the way we're expressing ourselves. And the other thing I always say is that the meaning that we associate to anything determines everything. So the meaning we associate to work, is it you know a place to express ourselves, to make the impact we want to make in the world? Or is it the place, the necessary evil that we have to go through in order to make some money so that we can pay our bills? The meaning we have associated the money, is it you know a tool for good? Is it something to set us free? Or is it the root of all evil? So the meaning that we have associated to things determine everything. And when we can change our meanings through mapping across and that sort of thing, we can take charge of our salivary response and we can learn to fall in love with those things that really enhance our life rather than taking it the other way. Yeah, and what I love about that a lot of people don't like to do something that's unfamiliar. Right. So if, oh, that's scary. It's unknown. I haven't done it. So I think I'll go over here where I don't have to do that. If I can then find where it's exactly the same, well, now it's not going to be that unknown. It's not going to be that uncomfortable because I already know it's pretty much just like this. It's going to get me there a little bit closer, it seems like. Yeah, I think you take more ownership of it in a positive based psychological way. So you're having expectations of positive results. You're approaching it like with that familiarity. So you own it more. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Well, Christopher, we're going to take just a moment to test your nerve. Test Your Nerve is brought to you by The Money Nerve. And for the listeners out there, if you want to test your nerve and uncover the dirty truth around your finances, visit testyournerve.com for our free financial quiz. All right, here we go. Down and dirty. We'll see. <laughs> You've mastered the art of reprogramming the mind for success. Yeah. If you could hack into the minds of all of our listeners and install one belief about money, what would it be? Huh. Interesting. The belief would be, it's about money, but it's a quote that I heard from Marcus Aurelius. He said, if a thing is humanly possible, consider it to be within your reach. And so for me, that's the aspirational quote that really encapsulates the idea that you can have it all. I love that. What's one belief or ideology around wealth that society accepts as normal that you might disagree with? That obviously that you have to be born into it. I mean, that's one you must hear that all the time. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the reality is, if you look at the top 10 richest people on the planet, most of them were self-made. So, yeah, just the idea that it's your upbringing or where you came from. And that's just doesn't hold true. Yeah, I think that's true. What's one of the craziest things you've ever spent money on? <laughs> craziest things I ever spent money on. Oh, I bought this little expanding bow staff because I'm a martial artist. So it was like this little metal thing that you're supposed to click like that and it pops out. It just looks so cool. But I did this as an adult. This is the scary <laughs> part. And then it folds down like that, but it was very dangerous. You take this little clip off and it's going to cut you up and stuff. I don't know how they possibly sell those, but that was pretty easy. <laughs> but you bought one. <laughs> I bought one anyway. Yeah. You bought one anyway. <laughs> yeah. What's one money rule that 
you follow that others might say is unconventional to others? Might be unconventional to others. Mm -hmm. It's a lesson that I got from Richard Branson and Sam Walton. They both had a belief that in times of cash crisis, it's time to expand rather than contract. And I think that helped me out at various times throughout my journey. Cool. All right. And last question, what's one unusual or quirky money ritual that you have? You've heard, no, I was going to say something really inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, that would be totally fine. <laughs> it's all welcome. <laughs> I was just going to make it up, but no, let's see. An unusual ritual that I have. Oh boy, I don't know that I have any unusual rituals. I don't have what I, Okay. Have you ever talked to your money? I don't talk to my money, but... I suppose I could. Yeah, I know. <laughs> do you talk to yours a lot? I do sometimes. I do. do. Okay. No, I like it. I like I, it. I like to have fun with it. Like I don't get. Eh. Yeah, it's not weird. It's not you weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if people saw me talking to my money or my wallet, they might think I was weird. But that's. <laughs> I just do that in private. <laughs> now I can think of weirder things now that you said that. But I'll keep it all to myself. I'm like, <laughs> well, let me ask you this. So. You talk about martial arts. That's something that you really enjoy. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious, martial arts to me is a discipline. Yeah. And I'm wondering if it's the discipline piece to it, the focus that is the attraction, or is it just fun to kick and punch? And how does martial arts play into your financial success or success? All of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Martial arts for me has been, yeah, discipline was probably the greatest lesson that I've learned from martial arts amongst everything. But the attitudes that were passed down from martial arts have been hugely instrumental in everything I've done. I've always said, like in our personal development seminars, I said the attitude with which you apply the tools are more important than any tool you'll ever learn. And so that I got from martial arts. The discipline, the whole idea of discipline for me was just showing up because one of the things that I've learned in martial arts is that you might go in one day and you might get your butt kicked and you might go in another day, you might be on top of the world, but it doesn't last that you feel on top of the world every time, especially when you've got the reality of the litmus paper of the having to tap out or lose in a match or something. And so I've always had that present. So for me, it wasn't about whether I had a good day or what I might perceive to be a challenging day. It was just showing up. It's so all I had to do was show up, show up, show up. If you show up enough, and you continue to make distinctions and you keep your attitude in check, you keep your spirit high, eventually you're going to make the black belt, right? And so right. I got three black belts. I got my first one when I was 21. I got my fifth degree in Chinese goju recently, and I've got a black belt in jiu-jitsu, which is Brazilian jiu-jitsu is tough to get. That's a tough black belt to get, but I love it. And it wasn't because I was so special. It was just because I showed up. And so that discipline pervades everything. And then you look at it and you go, okay, well, how do these things impact my success? There's no doubt that they did. I remember reading Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich eons ago. And when I read that book, the one idea that I said I was going to take to heart was the single-mindedness of purpose. Yep. Because the whole idea is if you take piano lessons for 20 years, you're going to get pretty good. There's no doubt about it. So all I had to do was pick my really long hill with my really wet snow that and stick with it. And eventually good things would happen. And that's exactly what happened. So for me, that was the magic. I was picking that really long hill and stay in the course. And then the, eventually the floodgates fly wide open and you're rewarded tremendously. You orchestrate tipping points. No, absolutely. And I, for me, I call, I put my blinders on and become singularly focused, obsessive almost when I have a goal annoying to other people because I can't let anything distract me. Right. If I'm in a get in shape, I can't look at the milkshakes and the cookies that are calling out my name. It's got to be... I'm looking ahead. Yeah, you got to not buy them in the first place and make sure your house is clear of any of the things that would pull you off track, right? So you can focus. Yeah, absolutely. Help set yourself up for success in that way. Right. My therapist said many, many years ago, what you need to do, you need to learn kickboxing. So I went to this guy and one-on-one -on -one and all that stuff. I was learning all the moves. It was amazing. Scary, but it was amazing. But then I had to get in the ring right? Then I actually had to spar. Like you can learn all the skills, but you got to step into the ring. And I remember the first time my coach, my mentor was a national champion, all these things. He wasn't just, he read a book and was teaching it, right? He was, he was legit. He was a master. And when he punched me in the face, 
<laughs> I'd never been hit like that. And I stopped. I was thinking to myself, do I cry? Do I run in the corner? <laughs> Or do I turn around and punch him back and freaking take this dude out? Right. And so I had this whole, all right, you're going to die. But for me, it seems like it wasn't until I actually engaged and then actually got over the fear, got hit in the face, started sparring and realizing, okay, I'm not going to die. Right. I might die, but most likely I'm not going to die. And it wasn't as scary as I thought it was once I engaged. Right. I think that's what we find with most things. That's why, like in dream, when we do dream analysis, they say that if you're having a repetitive nightmare where you're being chased by something, that turn around and face it. Right. And that's the same thing in life. Turn around and face it and see. And I think that goes back to the beginning of our conversation. Is it the momentum that you need to take by just taking your body there and then letting the rest follow? Is it shifting your mindset so that you fall in love with the process and you're able to, or you put your mindset in the best place for handling the task at hand? And I think it's probably a combination of all that. Yeah. And that's what takes us and helps us to break through things. I mean, ultimately, if we can fall in love with those things that are really healthy for us and make our life better, it's a better thing. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes easier said than done, but you can get there. You can get there, right? (laughs) So I'm curious, like you use these cutting edge techniques, NLP, hypnosis. Can you explain how these modalities really actually help reprogram someone's money mindset on a subconscious level? Well, one simple definition of things, Brian Tracy at one point said that the difference between the rich and the poor is that the poor associate pleasure to spending and pain to saving and investing, and the rich associate pain to spending and pleasure to saving and investing. So we could look at it from just a very chunked up perspective of the world and say, when we change our associations to things, we change our world. And so That's a very basic way to look at it. But the other thing is also, if we think of the idea that reality is subjective and the quantum theorists were bugged by this, Niels Bohr famously said, do you mean to tell me that the whole world changes simply because a mouse looks at it? But what becomes of the world through the eyes of a mouse? It's a different place. And you have your own subjective experience of reality. I have mine. Oprah Winfrey has hers. Richard Branson has his. So we all have our own unique way of sorting in the world and looking in the world. And it's based on who we are. It's based on the basis of our personality. So we have sorting patterns, but we're living in this quantum soup of pure potentiality. Every possibility we could want exists. Poverty, money, they both exist. But some people look at the screen of life and they see poverty and they mistake that for being what there is because they don't know how to change the programming. Yeah. So if you type in new words into the search engine of life, both experiences exist. You pull up different experiences. It's like turning the channel and all of a sudden it's like, wow, no, that's all there. Even for something as simple as somebody needs to produce 50 grand in a month. They're like, wait, this month I need 50 grand. Okay. Well, if you don't see it any place, it's because of the channel you're on. When you change the channel and you start focusing on the opportunities and the things that are there, your world could start to change. But once again, people go through their lives with it on the wrong channel and not knowing how to change anything. Because it's like Oprah said, when she grew up in the poverty and what was it, Kuskiosko, uh, Mississippi, she said, I would have never known there was anything existed that, other than the poverty that I grew up in if it wasn't for the books that I read. Right. And reading those books transported her imagination to other places where she could begin to forge a new life for herself. But so many people don't do that. They stay stuck. Yeah. And I guess you would say maybe this is also just changing the channel, but I'm thinking about people that will say, okay, there's wealth and there's poverty. If I have all this wealth, somebody else isn't going to have it? Or how can I celebrate all my abundance when people are sleeping in the streets or there is unhappiness in the world, right? Maybe that's somewhere in the middle, but maybe again, it's a different channel of learning to say, it's okay, I can't solve the whole world. And so I don't have to take myself out. I mean, where... Well, I think it's also microcosm, macrocosm. So there's Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. If you want to wipe out poverty, it's not going to help you by feeling feelings of poverty, the way to do it is to, first off, wipe it out within your own consciousness, step into a a wealth consciousness, then look to elevate the world. There's a guy named Taddy Bletcher who ran the first free university in South Africa called CETA. And back in 2006, it spent some time on Richard Branson's island, and he suggested that I go out there and work with these guys. And so we did, I brought 30 coaches out to South Africa. We worked with this group of 400 South African kids 
out there. And one of the things that Taddy said, he said, Chris, South Africa is not poor. He said, we're rich. We're rich in natural resources. We have diamonds. We have gold. We have so much in terms of resources. He said, what's impoverished is people's minds. Right. And he said, the key to transformation and raising people out of the poverty they're in is financial education. And there it wasn't like doing micro loans and stuff like they do in some countries. It was about helping people to uplift their entrepreneurial mindset so that they could create more jobs and transform things out there. But that really hit home for me was if we want to change the world, the best way to do it is to change ourselves and then become a shining light of inspiration for other people to see and to step up as well. I think that's the way to change. Yeah, absolutely. And as you were talking, I was thinking about people that are, yeah, I'm halfway there or I'm sort of established and I'm going to equate it to stand up. If you do stand up for a while and you get to a certain place and you're funny, well, now people expect a certain funny. Do you take the risk and do something that fails and then sets you back? Or do you just maintain, well, I'm sort of funny. It's good enough. Got it. Yeah. And I'm wondering in this place where some people have, I present, well, I've got a couple houses. If I ask for more help or if I seek some advice from a mentor, well, then they're going to see that maybe I'm not as far along as I thought I was. So maybe I trying to find that balance. So it sounded like there were a couple of things in there. There's the, okay, the status quo is fine. But then there was also, how am I going to put myself out there as if I'm supposed to have a veneer, right? If right. I'm supposed to be. That's correct. It's an interesting thought. And like on the second part on the, how do I put myself out there? Like, I remember I came to a point in time where I was very well known in my space. And this is about 10 years ago. I had the largest personal development presence in Australia, second largest in the UK. So we had a big presence that we were making. But I remember I hit a point in time and I used to love to go to seminars and trainings and all sorts of things to pour good things in. So I was constantly doing that. But it's like Sam Walton said from Walmart, he said, I spend more time in my competitor stores than I spend in my own. <laughs> right. So he said, I'd never had an original idea in my life. But nonetheless, <laughs> so I was going out there and doing that until one day I hit a time and I was invited to a very well-known speaker seminar by his team in London. And I went over to go to the seminar and they came to me in the back of the room and said, oh, we have to ask you to leave. Our promoter says your competition. And it was like, and I was invited by them, but the promoter had an issue with it. And so I had heard somebody say at one time, study while you can, because there's going to be some day where people aren't going to want to let <laughs> <let> you in. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So it's like immerse yourself while you can. But like my whole thing has always been immersion, constantly learning. I'm a consummate student. Like I said, I've got a three black belts. One of them's a fifth degree, but I'm a student. Like I never think of myself. Some people will say master to me and it just feels kind of weird. But like I say, I'm a student and it's the same thing with everything that we're learning. The idea that we know nothing is probably much more accurate than we know something. So that's kind of my thought about that. And then on the other side of the kind of the good enough type thing, I don't know about good enough. Like, I think there could be a couple of things happening there. Like, I think that that person's limitations, their limiting beliefs may be so covered things up that they're just not really tapping into the passion that could be there. Because if we love what we do, if we're inspired by what we do, I think we're going to want to get up and start to change things. So it could be an issue of passion. It could be an issue of trajectory. What's the trajectory the person's on? It also could be an issue of they're just limiting beliefs are so caked on that they don't want to let themselves through it. So the approach to it, I think, is going to be a little bit different based upon who we find. One thing, though, that I'll say that really changed things for me was just on a daily basis starting to ask myself, what am I most inspired by right now in my life? What am I most inspired by today in my life, right now in my life? And what's important to me about that? And how does that make me feel? And really getting anchoring in states that I know are driving states, states like inspiration, states like determination, states like enthusiasm, powerful high vibration states that if I'm living in those states, there's going to be good things happening. How do you live in good enough if you're living in a state of inspiration at the same time? It's like they can't coexist. So one way could be changing the states. Yeah. Probably the easy lay person's way is changing the states. And then we might look at other things too. Yeah, I love that. All right, I'm going to ask you this. Why do you think coaching can be so instrumental for someone who's looking to improve their financial situation? And what can they gain by working with, I won't say an expert, with a student like you? I think it's huge because 
I think it was Carl Jung who said, until we take that which is unconscious and make it conscious, we'll continue to get it reflected back in our life and we'll call it fate. Right. So that's the concept of projection. So we all have our stuff, our emotional baggage that we bring to the table. I can't tell you how many people that have come into my seminars, like thousands over the years that have gone and they were doing share trading courses and things like that. And they would come to me and they go like, well, what I was taught would be working if I just didn't invest emotionally. You hear the same thing right. every time. If I just didn't invest emotionally. And so they'll come in and they want to put things straight in terms of their own consciousness. And you'll hear in wealth creation courses, they say it's 70% mindset and 30% strategy, but then they typically will teach 70% strategy. <laughs> so it's like the mindset is so important in terms of everything that we create. So I have a program that I teach. I'll be doing it in Bali, November 1st through 7th called Billionaire Bootcamp. And what we do inside that training is we model the billionaire mindset. So we take all these billionaires, we reverse engineer their success, but look at what strategies did they employ? What are their values? What are their beliefs? How do they think? All of that sort of stuff so that we could install it in people to open up the super highways of their neurology so they can go out and create things that they could never create before. Those types of results don't come from just popping out of the womb and living your life. That type of result doesn't come unless we're blessed with having it introduced to our lives. And I was blessed by having that introduced to my life and it radically transformed everything for me. Not even just a little bit, like radically. I will say that everything was necessary. The mentor was a necessary component of that. If I just did the modeling, I don't believe that I would have created what I did, but it was all of those things. And eventually we did a hundred million dollars in sales of our seminars around the planet, but that would not have happened had I not radically shifted my thinking. So in terms of the methodologies that I use with people, it's not because I'm so great that we're able to create that. It's because we're modeling the best of the best and the water is always purest when it's closest to source. And I always tell people, if you don't want to be a billionaire, you can always scale it back. We're not going to make you be a billionaire, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think the other thing that I want to just name here, not every billionaire looks the same, right? You're not going to create 8,000 people that each have a portfolio that's 25% real estate, right. 10% yeah. precious metals a horse farm, right? Everybody's going to bring in their own unique flavor. Yeah. It's about that mindset that says everything is possible. Yeah, 100%. And there's other aspects of it too. I mean, the billionaires are obsessed with expansion. They're constantly expanding in many, if not most cases, right? But yeah, there's, there's going to be those similarities between the mindsets that they have. But to your point, and I love that, that there's different casts. There's different, it's like, You've got a flashlight, which is the light of consciousness. And you remember those little things you could put over the flashlight with shapes and dinosaurs right. and stuff. And you can, you just change the shape. That's the filter and you change it on. If you project the world of Richard Branson or Oprah Winfrey or whatever it is. So changing our filters helps us to project into the world in an infinitely more powerful way. But it's also our choice. We can choose. Like the billionaire that I related most to was Richard Branson. But when I started studying Warren Buffett and got his common sense, wisdom, just that, like it just, I was, I fell in love. Like I was like, oh my God. And I never would have known that had I not gotten out of my own zone of thinking. But then if you take the investment wisdom of Buffett and you combine it with the flamboyance of a brand, so then you get something new. That's right. And essentially who we are today is based upon the different pieces that we took from different people and colors and we create our life. So no, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Christopher, we're at the m M&M moment, money and motivation, our sweet spot. I'm wondering if you can give the listeners a practical financial tip or a piece of wealth wisdom, something that's worked for you? I think that I'll actually say two things. I think the number one is being on your true north in life. And you hear that from everybody. And it's so important that probably I am not the only person who's ever said this on here. I know that I'm not. But following your passion is so critical because if you don't love what you do, you'll never stick with it long enough to be truly financially successful. And it's through the passion that we have the desire to become the best in the world. And if you're the best in the world, there's always a market for you. It's that love of what it is that you're doing and the love of the process as you're growing it. And I think also just your ability to turn obstacles into opportunities, because we're all going to get the obstacles. We're all going to get the challenges that come up. But your ability to look at that and say, how do I turn this into the best thing that ever happened in my world? How do I turn this into the best thing that ever happened in my investors world? How do I turn it? If we keep that mindset open, that will help us to develop the resilience and the stick to itness to eventually make it to what we're creating. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Christopher, I appreciate that. One of the things I really appreciate, and I was just talking with somebody about this the other day, my belief, we all need to come in as students. Yeah. If we come in as experts, our ego takes over. I know this. I know that. 
and we don't open the mind. And staying as a student, as somebody that's constantly learning, our mind continues to stay open to possibility. So I appreciate you naming that. I was just having this conversation with somebody about how it just feels like our leaders don't have to be experts. Our leaders, I'd like them to have some experience, (laughs) but not that they're coming from, I know everything. Yeah, And that just feels real important. The other thing that you talked about, and I, again, these are things that I hold very near and dear. If we don't bring our unconscious to consciousness, it's going to stay there and it's going to keep driving us sort of like those little things at Disneyland when you're riding a ride and you're like, why am I going this way? Because underneath, this thing is taking you down a path you maybe don't want to go, but <laughs> that's where you are, right? And if we can bring it up and say, oh, change the track. I want to go over here. If we don't bring it to conscious that we can't name it, we can't claim it, we can't own it. And so I appreciate you touching on that. And really just this piece around mindset, like you said, 70% mindset, 30% strategy. I think some of us focus on just let me learn these techniques. Right. And then I know, and then it comes from, then I know, and that's again, back to ego when we're like, just give me the recipe versus, oh, let me get in the kitchen and start exploring with the ingredients. So what I didn't hear was a lot of, you can never have it. It's only for certain people. There's a possibility if it's humanly possible and it's been thought or funk, then it's possible for all of us. And I like that piece also about being the closest to the source is going to be the purest. So I appreciate you bringing all that because it's so important in the world and we all just need to be out there learning and being students in this journey called life. Where can people find you online and social media, all that good stuff? Best place to go for me, our site, www.chrishowardgift.com. And I have three gifts on there for anybody that jumps on there. Jump on there fast in case I change the page, (laughs) but it happens. But there's one, if you're looking to break through barriers within yourself, I've got a gift on there for you. If you want to be a transformational coach or speaker, I've got a gift on there for you. And if you want to build your business or scale up, I've got a gift on there for you too. So you can pick the perfect gift for you. And you can reach me on Instagram at Chris Howard Live. So that's one place you can reach me as well. And super thrilled to have been here with you today. This has been a whole lot of fun. The great interviewer. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, I really appreciate what you're doing out there. And I... Hope that our listeners will go out there and be the students that they want to be and have the life they want. So thank you again for joining us. Cheers. Hey there, Money Master. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Did you learn some valuable insights around your relationship with money? Our guests shared some of their financial epiphanies. You might have experienced one too. Don't just sit there with that aha moment. Share it with us and the world by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Or leave a comment on one of our socials, at Money You Should Ask. Let's spread the word and help others explore their financial health too. But that's not all. Do you want to live in abundance and build wealth that can sustain you and your family for generations to come? It only takes one thing. The willingness to change the way you think about your money. It's time to test your money nerve and discover what's been holding you back from financial freedom. Take the free quiz now at themoneynerve.com and begin your journey towards a prosperous future.